Okay, so this, of course, is marine money. Our bread and butter is uh, maritime finance, and now we have our first finance panel of the day. Uh, very happy to have uh, Chris uh, Vartsis, uh, partner of Stevenson Harwood, as moderator. And on the panel, in no particular order, or on the order actually from the uh, agenda, we have George Tselepis, who's director of shipping at Credit Suisse, Theofanis Mustakatos, who's head of shipping National Bank of Greece, Elias Katsoulis, head of shipping Deutsche Bank, Nicolas Pavlidis, who yeah. is head of shipping of Bank of Cyprus, Hugh Calme, head of DNB representative office here in Athens, and Michael De Visser, managing director and head of shipping at NIBC Bank. Chris, please. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you very much for um, inviting us today. Actually, I'm very impressed to see this line of well-established bankers active in the Greek shipping market. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitations and being here today. Um, so what we're trying to cover today, uh, and I'm quite conscious that uh, we have only 30, 35 minutes to cover the topic, is we propose to delve uh, into the topic of financing opportunities in shipping during sto strong market cycles, especially in the interesting sh Greek shipping markets. Over the last 25 years, there have been alternative means of financing, but it does seem that ship uh, 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 banks remain the mainstay in supporting Greek shipping. Uh, so what we will try to, um, to discuss today is how the banks navigate risks, especially in a climate where vessel values are strong, future, ships, uh, future ship fuels are under discussion, and interest rates haven't been this high in the two decades. Um, I would like to extend uh, the first topic that we shall cover uh, is the dynamics of bank lending in a strong market cycle. And I would like to extend my first question to Ug. Um, Ug, uh, how do you view the Greek shipping positioning and potential in both lending and capital markets in the context of the current market conditions and microeconomic conditions? Can you focus on the challenges and the opportunities that may arise in this context, please? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. First of all, thanks a lot, Chris, for the uh, invitation to join the panel. Um, maybe I'd like to start by saying that our clients um, are in very sound financial position. You know, uh, they've been uh, having uh, a good uh, freight rates over the past uh, couple of years. They've accumulated quite a lot of cash reserves. Um, leverage are in general quite moderate, and we've seen most of our clients addressing their uh, refinancing risk uh, coming ahead. So the, the, the picture on the client side is uh, quite positive. Um, and that's the backdrop, I think, for the client to have access to a lot of different uh, sources of, of capital. And I think they clearly have the choice uh, to select the best uh, source of capital for their different uh, projects. W when it comes to you know, banks, uh, we've seen banks being extremely uh, active and keen to lend. And you know, let's see what my uh, fellow panelists will say. But, but certainly, we've seen a great level of appetite uh, to lend into shipping, uh, partially also because we've seen the, the other core segments, such as the, the property market, SMEs, uh, reducing as a consequence of uh, inflation. Uh, and, I, and I strongly believe that uh, banks will continue to be a sort of the main source of uh, capital for, for shipping companies in the future. Uh, you know, having said that, uh, you know, DNB, we've, we've continued to be active in the, the debt capital market, uh, particularly on any energy related uh, companies, you know, LNG. LPG and, and offshore, that's markets where I've been extremely active. Uh, the more traditional segments like dry bulk, uh, because of lower valuations, I think it's been a bit more challenging to, uh, uh, to issue equity, but uh, you know, at the right price, I'm sure there is appetite. Uh, on the debt capital market, uh, we've seen uh, an increase in volumes and inflow of funds in the Nordic. Uh, so we're back at pre-COVID levels in terms of uh, uh, volumes, although in the US we're still at the very low, uh, uh, low level. So I think it depends on which markets you can uh, have access to uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of appetite. Uh, but there are challenges, of course. I think the uh, macroeconomic backdrop is, uh, is uncertain. Uh, I think we've seen that the aggressive policy of the uh, central banks in the West have taken a stall on the global economy. 
uh, we're believers into a soft landing next year as opposed to a recession. But obviously, that's a, that's a, a sector to watch. Um, I don't think we've seen many clients hedging uh, their interest rate risk, you know, when rates were still low. Uh, so I think there's that cost component that ship owners will have to deal with for the years to come. And we, we are believers into higher rates for longer. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll just cut short to, to my answer. But also, I think, obviously, the uh, environmental regulation uh, is you know, always a, a burning topic. But that will drive a lot of the challenges and opportunities uh, in, in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, George, uh, in your view, how has a strong market cycle been influencing the shipping financing landscape globally, and in particular, um, the Greek shipping market? Give some time to share your views with us. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Pleasure. So, look, I think uh, clearly the last uh, two, three years, starting in uh, 2020 after COVID, have been uh, exceptional for shipping. And uh, the, the result of that has been a very strong liquidity level for uh, ship owners. Now, last time we saw a similar situation was back in 2004, 2008. But the difference between now and back then is that we don't see the same amount of uh, new building ordering especially if one excludes container ship ordering, which is mostly done by the liners. If you recall back then, people were ordering ships to be built at shipyards that were not even built yet. So today we're nowhere near that level of uh, exuberance uh, for a variety of reasons, which uh, we can discuss separately. And I think Jerry touched up on some of them uh, in the previous panel. Uh, so a very distinct trend that we see from owners as a result of the strong market cycle that you mentioned is uh, using part of that liquidity to prepay loans and reduce their leverage, as opposed to reinvesting in uh, new capex. And of course, this trend is accentuated by the higher cost of debt uh, due to increasing interest rates, which is also very logical. Mm -hmm. So I think what you will be seeing is banks shipping portfolios uh, amortizing faster than scheduled. And uh, you know, of course, uh, one has to remain disciplined in a situation like this, uh, because as you correctly point out, asset values are elevated and uh, certainly above mid-cycle levels, I would say. Thank you very much, George. Since I've got you on the panel, I cannot resist asking uh, asking you um, whether Credit Suisse will continue to show an interest in the shipping market after its, uh, its acquisition by UBS, and if so, um, how, if any, um, if how will its approach change if, if that's the case? Look, uh, very much so. Look, uh, Ship finance at CS has a history of 80 years and uh, an impeccable track record. So the business will continue within the group. Now, when it comes to the approach or the model, if you like, uh, the fundamental principles of the model will remain. But of course, tweaks here and there will always have to be made, uh, if anything, to adjust to changing circumstances, be it regulatory or geopolitical. And uh, in terms of appetite, uh, look, for shipping appetite for me is a function of the market cycle. And actually, it should be inversely related to the market cycle. So the level of appetite should and will vary from time to time, adjusting to the state of the shipping markets, and this has always been the case. Um, thank you very much, George. On this positive note, um, um, Nicholas, uh, we, we, ha we have already uh, mentioned the fact that um, vessel values are typically high at the moment. Uh, in, in your opinion, how are banks re-evaluating their lending portfolios? Are new vessels acquisitions seen as lucrative or high risk? I would say that um, uh, high asset values on, on its own is just a, a point in the cycle. Uh, you need to look at it, put it into perspective. Um, and, and banks uh, often finance uh, uh, cash flows and, and ability to produce cash flow rather than just the, the, the naked asset value. But um, um, if you look at the um, generation of uh, liquidity that's been in, in almost all sectors in shipping over the past uh, at least couple of years, probably gives an incentive to ship owners to, to participate more in, in new projects and the high interest rates as well, high uh, inflation, which uh, with with high commodity prices, which keep uh, uh, together with other factors, likely to keep the uh, um, new building values high, 
and um, uh, cascade that to second-hand values. I think overall um, th there's a lot of factors to be taken into account, and, and from my perspective, it's it's case by case. Um, from a relationship banking perspective, is um, know your customers, know their operations, try to add value, and be able to support them whether values are high or low in good markets and in bad. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. Ilya, um, pricing is one of the major considerations nowadays for, or always actually, for SIP owners. Um, in this context, how do you see the impact of the current persistent high inflation rates and high interest rates on SIP finance? And in your view, how can banks and SIP owners address such risks and effectively, effectively navigate such risks? Thank you, Chris. Um, I mean, I'm going to state the obvious here. Uh, it's all about cash flow, and shipping companies are really good in managing the cash flow. That's why we, we like banking with shipping companies. So um, what I have to say, though, is that over the last few years, we've tried to be very careful around interest rate risk around our own portfolio, but I didn't feel that ship owners um, were welcome when I was asking for uh, interest rate loans to be hedged. Now we see that the situation is a bit different. The cost is sky high, uh, cost of capital for any shipping company. And uh, the issue, I think, going forward is whilst we have an inverted yield curve, we, are, we live in a world of high uncertainty. We have you know, a new war in the Middle East. We don't know, you know if the increase in oil prices will lead into more inflation, it will lead to more interest rate hikes, and so on. So I think I urge the community, and, and it's the way I also look at, at, at my own portfolio, is even though the, uh, the yield curve is inverted, there's still a risk out there. And individual companies will think about how they manage that cash flow risk on their own. But I don't think it's a simple case where we, we can say that there's no need for interest rate hedging anymore just because interest rates are expected to go down. Um, so that's that's kind of some kind of food for thought, I think, for, for, for the industry. Thank you very much, Leah. Um, on the same topic, uh, Fanny, uh, how do you see high interest rates influence borrowers' decision making? We, we have already covered the uh, the issue of prepayments. In your view, what's going to be the trend in the next year, and how this may have an impact on a ba on banks' portfolios? First of all, thank you for the invitation. I think previously in the ship owners panel, and everybody will say that prepay, it's a very rational thing to do, and I agree, although we have smaller shipping portfolios. This is very healthy for them and for us. And uh, don't forget some years ago that we prefer the prepayment rather than the late payment, okay? So the decisions, I think, are rational. But also I would like to put on the table that the, the Greek ship owner had about, in the following years, about 28 billion of new buildings at these asset prices. The next two years, they have deliveries of 230 vessels. And some of them, might be already difficult to finance because of the asset price, not because of the spot, the asset price and the cash flow. So I think, although it's not a good thing for a banker to say, I like prepayment. I like for our customers to increase the cash buffers. I know that there's a notion that, you know, I'm losing 10% every year, do I have cash? I think everybody agrees that volatility has increased. And uh, by definition, volatility is rapid and unpredict unpredictable changes. So I, th I think if we vote, we'll have a 90% that volatility has increased. So the risk has increased. So it's, it's good to have prepayments. It's good that I hear this cautionary approach from the Greek ship owners. But on the other hand, we have 28 billion to finance in the following years on uh, new buildings, Greek and foreign banks, only from the Greek owners. 
that's a very high figure. Thank you very much, Fanis. Um, Michael, um, over the last 25 years, we have the emergence of alternative means of financing. The representatives of those who not really like this characterization, because in their view, they are not alternative. Um, what strengths keep banks central to the international Greek shipping community, in your view? And um, how do banks differentiate themselves and adapt to the emerging trends and demand to remain competitive and the primary choice of ship owners in the Greek market, but also globally? The primary source of ship owners. I think that is just a big bag of money at the cheapest level with no conditions at all, uh, flexible as possible. So I don't think that um, uh, that's only banks. <laughs> <laughs> just can be anybody who provides that money. Um, the strength of the bank. I would say the, the strength of the bank is in essence the um, the access to retail deposits. We have a bank license and that allows us to attract money at hardly any interest payment. Uh, I think especially in, in Greece, banks don't pay so much on these uh, retail deposits. Uh, in Holland, it's already a bit more. So if you look at uh, that strength, that's at the same time our biggest weakness because it was already said in 2004, 2008, banks uh, uh, did a lot of financings uh, and uh, after that period lost a lot of money. And uh, we have seen increased regulations, which means that um, uh, these retail deposits need to be protected. At this moment, we're a bit over-regulated, which means that, in essence, it's better as a bank to provide high leverage at no repayment and no covenants, uh, because then uh, at least in the next five years, you don't have to add any capital requirements. But um, uh, I, I do not agree then with previous uh, speakers that, um, shipping is about cash flows. It has proven to be about loan to values. And I do agree with the fact that we have to be very disciplined. And I think that is uh, ultimately a bit the competitive edge. Uh, shipping, has to be, uh, shipping banks have to be disciplined, have to be patient, and uh, to differentiate from other financial institutions without a banking license, because that is what you're talking about, who are more flexible. I think we just have to sit right and, and wait till the interest rates go down um, or, like uh, what is happening now, subsidize uh, our margins, which have been reducing, with uh, the spread between the retail deposits and uh, the Euribor, the LIBOR. That's a bit what, what, what's happening, of course. That's, uh, we make more money on funding than uh, that we these days make on, uh, on lending. Look at, uh, you know, if a big bank is lending at 180 base points, uh, you uh, have to deduct 26 basis points uh, adjustment spread. Uh, you have to take into consideration 50, 60 percent loan to uh, income of uh, cost income ratio, and some cost. What, what do they the tax? What do they make? 40 basis points? Yeah, you, you, you can't make 10 percent plus return on on the credit uh, like that. You have to do it uh, by other ways. So we have to continue to uh, to make sure that we have the cheapest funding, and um, uh, differentiate us uh, us from that. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, let's move on to the next topic that I would like to cover, which is ESG decarbonization and green financing. Um, George, um, in your opinion, has green financing somehow lost traction recently as ESG and decarbonization consideration affect credit analysis? If so, what initiatives need to be taken and by whom, especially the financial institutions in order to render sustainability and green financing more attractive for the market players. Thanks again, Christopher. Look, I don't, I don't think it has a uh, lot of traction. I think uh, lenders are particularly willing and mm -hmm. uh, focused to bank projects that help steer the sector towards greener operations. And uh, in fact, the competition we see on projects that really sort of push the envelope on such matters is much more intense. So I don't think there is any shortage of bank capital for uh, true ESG projects. At the same time, uh, one has to be mindful that uh, it is the industry, ultimately, that will innovate, reinvent itself, and uh, find the solutions along the path that has been drawn. Uh, financiers in shipping will be enablers, yes, and are very much driven to be that and enable the transition, but they will not be originators of the technology required. 
Now, when it comes to the initiatives that uh, you asked, uh, first, if you look at bank lending, the margin component of the overall cost of debt, which is basically what banks can influence and steer, is anything between 20 to 40 percent. That very same margin component, when measured against the overall cost of the investment, is anything between a mere one to two percent. So what I'm trying to say here is that it's clear that investment decisions in shipping are not being made with the cost of debt as the primary driver. The fundamental and defining driver behind the decision is people's perception of whether assets are cheap or expensive, whether the investment makes financial sense. So with that in mind, I think what would have much greater impact, much greater weight in uh, driving decarbonization in the sector is uh, our more direct initiatives, initiatives by regulators that uh, would directly increase the cost of pollution and basically fundamentally change the economic dynamics between the use of conventional fuels versus alternative fuels. So if we can design and implement pricing mechanisms that help that build strong enough incentives towards uh, the right direction, that should definitely stimulate investment and uh, R&D for alternatives even further. And a good example of that is the EU emissions trading system that we discussed uh, before, which starts to kick in uh, next year. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. Ug, on the same topic, in the rapidly evolving regulatory landscape surrounding Greek shipping, green shipping, how are banks adjusting their credit risk assessments for vessel financing? Um, are there any specific benchmarks or KPIs your bank is integrating into your evalu evaluations? And how do you approach the valuations of older vessels which may require um, considerable retrofitting or may face potential obsolescence? First of all, I'll, I'll start by uh, agreeing, by saying I agree with George's statements about the fact that banks have continued to push towards, uh, uh, you know, the energy transition, decarbonization, and being even more demanding on the targets that we uh, fixed into, into our laws. Uh, at DNB, ESG has been part of our risk assessment process for, for many years as the, the same level of the financial risk and uh, compliance risk. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, been, it's been the case for, for quite some time. Uh, I think you raised the question of uh, the risk of financing stranded assets and that would become, uh, uh, you know, useless well before their um, standard economic life. Um, this is something that we're, we're, we're following very closely. And I think the way we've, we've tried to address that is to be quite moderate in our uh, financing approach where we offer a leverage and uh, a repayment profile, which we find decent in the case of a uh, model market downturn. So we look at you know historical valuations and try to make a sense of where could be the, the right balance. Um, uh, but you know, we, we are a corporate lender you know, mostly, as opposed to an asset lender. So, you know, our bulk of the analysis will be on the corporate and the company's uh, strategy in place to address the uh, changes in, in regulation. And, uh, you know, we welcome uh, the initiative of certain owners, you know, ordering ships uh, with fitted engines, potentially burning uh, green fuels. But I also think that the retrofitting of existing ships should be part of the uh, mix you know, subject to sound financial and environmental uh, returns, but that should be part of the equation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to the future fu fuels theme now, Michael. Um, the dilemma of choosing amongst uh, green fuels has recently been described by the CEO of a prominent publicly listed shipping company, and I quote, as the challenge of selecting a COVID vaccine. Difficult to know which one works best. How is your bank approaching this dilemma as the industry transitions to alternative fuels and faces stringent decarbonization targets set by the IMO? Well, we're not a corporate lender, we're an asset financier. So for us, it is important to understand uh, what the impact of the fuel is on, on the vessel. Uh, we're not technicians. So in essence, we just rely on the professional owner who together with the classification and the insurance companies uh, make sure that uh, 
these uh, fuels are uh, viable to, to operate in. So I think that is for us the most important part. Um, if we look at, at financing green assets, uh, we're, we're very much open for financing green assets. Uh, it's not easy because they're, they're, they're more expensive and at the same time, our, uh, you know, our reference is uh, to conventional vessels. Like what is the premium that you have to pay for a ship and how do you earn that premium back? If you don't earn that pr premium, then it means that the bank is taking a higher asset risk in the longer term. So it, it's not, not easy, but we, we rely on, on the technicians and on the owners and the professionals. Uh, anybody wants to add anything on this point? Thank you. Um, the next topic that I would like to cover is uh, the possibility of, or, or the propensity of collaborations um, with historic shipping banks exiting the industry, new opportunities for other banks may emerge or have emerged actually. Um, Nicholas, what strategic commitment does your bank have toward the Greek shipping industry and how do you envisage filling the gap left by banks which have exited? Um, and in this context, how do you plan to adapt your financing approach in response to the changing landscape of ship finance? Thank you. I'll, um, I'll say that the historic banks, as you call them, uh, when, when they left, they indeed op op opened the space when um, where, where new banks could come in or other banks, banks that had lower exposure in shipping or new banks, in uh, particularly in the Hellenic space in Greece and Cyprus. In Cyprus, where I'm based, shipping is about 7% of GDP. So, um, um, small team of us moved from RBS in London down to um, uh, Cyprus and have a, a, an ambitious plan there to, to create a portfolio. But be beyond that, in, in the general Hellenic space, the, the, I, I think that in Greece and, and, and Cyprus, the, it, it, it's, it's not just an opportunic move, it's, it's a um, strategic long-term commitment and it's not just profitable, um, business. It, it's um, uh, when, when banking uh, with owners who you know for years and they're based in your backyard and, um, and, and they're very successful worldwide in what they do. One of the, 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 the most um, um, a, a part of the cluster of the most successful uh, community, shipping community in the world, it, it, you also add a, a, an element of diversification and internationalization into your portfolio so it, because it's not shipping is not uh, strictly connected to the local economy but quite the opposite uh, linked to the international trade and international economic factors but in, in just, just to move on in, in terms of adapting I think smaller banks can adapt um, as fast they don't have the, the disadvantage perhaps the proximity to the senior management of the banks, the smaller portfolio or um, uh, being close to the clients gives them a, an, an advantage. And, and I think um, whether it is technological issues um, or, or doing our bit for the environment um, or, or, or um, you know, keeping up th with regulations and compliance, all these issues, the banks need to move fast and um, in a rapidly changing business environment, like in, 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 in the physical environment, it's not who's um, bigger or stronger, but who adapts faster that will benefit most. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, Fadis, um, some argue that small ship owners, and we have plenty of them in the Greek shipping market, should explore partnerships with larger players in order to enhance the returns in the evolving market. What is your perspective on the role of such collaborations, consolidation attempts in the Greek shipping industry, particularly considering the energy transition, something we have already um, touched on, and the need of decarbonization, and how can banks like NDG support such collaborative initiatives? I think Martin Parker said before, <laughs> take the, di the data, the market is becoming more transparent, you need the technology. We are talking about CO2 emissions trading. All this 
needs corporate structure. Needs more people, more expense of payroll, a different way of doing things. So there is a push, a trend towards larger shipping groups. That doesn't mean that the, the middle or the small have to be out of the market. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm always saying is be prepared for what is coming. So I think, and especially for Greeks to collaborate, it's not a good. Not the easiest of options. <laughs> especially ship owners. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's better to plan. It's, it's related to what I said before about since we agree that there is the volatility, let's have a plan A and a plan B and plan B. Let's have the soft landing and the hard landing. Okay, so I think uh, simply to be prepared and be open-minded to change the structure of the company, to take the extra expenses, to change the organization, being small, medium, or large. Certainly, to be large helps a lot to attract talent and also experiment and pilot with you. So I think consolidation will happen. I don't know the rate and the the extent, because whatever we are discussing today will drive consolidation. And uh, we have to, to plan for it. Thank you very much, Fanny. And the last topic that I would like to briefly cover with Elias is geopolitics. We have already covered that topic on previous panels. But I would like, Elias, to get your, your opinion as to how banks can adapt to align with evolving regulations and respond effectively to challenges such as sanctions, regulatory changes that could impact a bank's lending strategies? And how does your bank navigate through such uncertainties as part of your lending strategy? When it comes to sanctions, there's not much I can say. It's just it's, it's a no tolerance issue. Um, so. Hopefully, I mean, reality is that in, in the current environment, we have to exercise even higher amount of scrutiny monitoring our portfolio. Um, and more importantly, when we admit new clients, we have to make sure that they are the right counterparties, that they fit into our culture, and we have a duty to do the appropriate due diligence to do so. Um, it's a bit trickier these days because clearly banks are competing against each other very aggressively to find clients, that gives potentially the opportunity for uh, some banks to be uh, effectively force themselves to do business with clients that potentially they wouldn't have done so. So all I'm saying is that this is you know, for myself and for kind of fellow bankers, let's do our due diligence properly um, and, and make sure we, you know, we, we do the right thing in terms of who we admit because it's not helpful for anyone for banks to be financing uh, counterparts that they shouldn't be financing. That completes our panel discussion. Any questions from the audience? No time for that. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the banking panel. Um, I'd like to call on Mr. George Saroglu, if he is here. Yeah, he is. And Nikos Takos uh, has been held up in uh, New York, but we have Mr. George Saroglu, who's president of 10 Limited, to give us a couple of comments and welcome us to lunch. George, please. Good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I'm George Saroglu, President and Chief uh, Operating Officer of Chaco's Energy Navigation. This year we celebrate uh, 30 years as a public company. Mr. Chakos, our find founder and CEO, would have been here to address uh, Marine Money, but uh, he sends his regards to all of you. He's traveling and he's on a mission to deliver 30 on 30. This means $30 on uh, the 10 share price now that we celebrate and enter the fourth decade 
as a public market. It has been a very exciting and rewarding journey for TEN. In the past 30 years, we have navigated successfully through the ups and downs of the tanker market, dealt with a lot of crises. Some of these crises were self-inflicted, like the overbuilding that we had a few years back. But some of the crises were very much uh, exogenous crises, like uh, the crisis that we faced recently with COVID-19 COVID and the war. But I have to say that thanks to our model, we have managed its time to come up uh, on top, stronger, growing the company, growing the fleet, and posting very strong and very solid bottom line numbers. We started with uh, four tankers back in 1993. I I'm sure you've heard this thing many, many times. And we have currently 59 vessels in the water, plus a very active new building program that is building for our company green tankers uh, as we embark to on a historic journey, decarbonization journey, the whole industry, including, of course, us. Very briefly, some very key numbers on 10 on these 30 years in the public markets. We have built 94 new buildings with a total investment of over 6 billion since 1997 in the aftermath of the Asian crisis. Since our listing in New York Stock Exchange in 2002, which is 21 years and counting, we have generated 2.5 billion in net uh, income, and we have distributed over 770 million of dividends to all our shareholders, common and preferred. We have built an industrial model doing repeat business with a blue chip customer base that year in and year out secures for 10 on a rolling two year basis time charts with a minimum revenue backload of over 1 billion. And we have embarked in this green transition. We have a 10 vessel new building program that will be live, will be the foundation for our company's transition to a greener shipping future. And in fact, we have taken delivery of the first one vessels and intend to take the second one very shortly this month. We are very glad to be associated with uh, Marine Money. We have been associated with your team for a long, long time. Jim, Matt, Kevin, Mia. I remember the early conversation that we had way back then when we were talking about the shipping models, net book value, return to the shareholders, all these nice things. Congratulations, Marin Mani, on your 25th anniversary event in Greece. I think it's a, a big milestone to many more successful events, and it's a proof of the hard work that you have put uh, together all these years. Thank you all, and without no further delays, let's break for lunch. Thank you very much. Yeah, 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 thank you.